Well, good evening. good evening. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, Quincy, California. Turn with me this evening in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 27. The book of Proverbs, chapter 27. <clears throat> the theme of the book of Proverbs, if you haven't figured out already, through 26 chapters, it's wisdom. It's wisdom. And the key verse is Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. But, that's a word of contrast, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools don't want anything to do with wisdom and instruction, especially the wisdom and instruction that come by way of God's word. Fools don't want a part of that. But those who are wise, those who have a fear of the Lord, those who reverence God, do want a part of that. So let's jump right in. Look with me now at Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. This proverb reminds us that God is sovereign. That he is in charge of today and tomorrow. This doesn't mean that we don't plan. But that we submit our plans to God. And we trust God instead of trusting in our plans. Amen? Amen. If our plan doesn't go according to plan, we know that God has a better plan. Amen? Amen? If our plan doesn't go according to plan... We need to know and trust that God has a better plan for us. So don't boast about tomorrow, what you're going to do, what you're going to achieve. You don't know what tomorrow brings, but God does. Now look at verse 2. Let another man praise you and not your own mouth, a stranger and not your own lips. Self-promotion is a form of pride and it ought to be avoided. It is better to be good at what you do and let somebody else, another man, praise you and not your own mouth. If you want to be promoted, then work hard. Excel at your work and you should be recognized. That's kind of the simple formula of it, isn't it? Work hard and be rewarded. At least that used to be the formula that, that most of us worked under most of our working lives. Work hard and, and you'll be rewarded. Work hard and you'll be promoted. That doesn't seem to be the case today, but it was the case in our day and age. Now look at verse 3. A stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than both of them couple of true statements. A stone is heavy. I don't know if you ever picked up rocks. I rolled some rocks around my yard as uh, one home I lived in, and I, I bought these big rocks as decorative rocks, right? And Well, in fact, it was I was building a, uh, uh, a swing set for my children on a down slope of a hill, so I had to tear into the slope and build this uh, a section up with rocks for a space big enough for my kids' swing set. Well, we called those dummy rocks because <laughs> uh, they were two-man rocks that one man was picking up. So only a dummy would do that. That's how I ruined my back if anyone ever wanted to know that. But those things are true. Stones are heavy. Sand is weighty. They're hard to lift. Just like those things are heavy and can injure you if they fall on you, a fool's wrath is heavier than both of them. In other words, a fool's wrath, if it falls on you, it can injure you. So the lesson of this proverb is avoid the fool and avoid the fool's wrath. In verse 4 it says, Wrath is cruel and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before jealousy? Now both wrath and anger are often expressed openly. You know when someone is angry at you. But jealousy is often held in secret and often expressed behind the back 
where you don't know it's happening to you. This is why it's hard to stand before jealousy because you don't know what's taking place. It's hidden. It's secret. It's hard to fight those things you don't know about. So this proverb doesn't so much as tell us something to do or to avoid. It just states the fact that jealousy is hard to fight because it's so often hidden. In verse 5 it says, Open rebuke is better than love, carefully concealed. Now this is an interesting proverb. And it explains to us that it is not truly love when we refuse to lovingly administer correction to one another when it's needed. We are often hesitant to correct one another. I am often hesitant to correct you, especially if you cuss in front of me. So here is your correction. Stop doing it. <laughs> Not only in front of me, but stop cussing, period. There you have it. Open rebuke is better than carefully concealed love. You see, it's not really loving to allow sin to go unchecked. Real love cannot be concealed in the face of sin. If we really love one another, then we are going to confront sin in a loving manner because we care about one another and we know how destructive sin is. Amen? In verse 6 it says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. A real friend can speak to us in ways that may at times wound us. But just like the last proverb, those words are spoken because that person really cares about us, really loves us. On the other hand, there are those that like to kiss up to us, but they aren't really our friend. They shower us with attention and flattery and praise. Beware of those people, especially those people you know are not really your friend. When your enemy starts kissing up to you, beware. Remember, it was Judas who betrayed Jesus with a kiss. His kiss was deceitful. He wasn't a true friend. He was an enemy. In verse 7 it says, A satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb. But to a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. And, and this proverb can be taken in two ways. In the negative, people that have it all and have no need look down on the things they consider of, of lesser value. Because they are satisfied with great wealth or material goods or even good health, they look down on those who are lacking those things. But those who are lacking those things, who perhaps lack material wealth or material goods or even good health, those people, every bitter thing is sweet to them. Charles Spurgeon used this proverb as a basis to speak of the sweetness of Jesus and his work for us. He said, sweet is liberty to the captive. And when the sun makes you free, you are free indeed. Sweet is the pardon to the condemned and proclaims full forgiveness and salvation. Sweet is health to the sick. And Jesus is the great physician of souls. Sweet is light to those who are in darkness and to eyes that are dim. And Jesus is both our sun to our darkness and eyes to our blindness. End quote. Sweet indeed are those things we often overlook because of our fullness. Amen? Sweet indeed are those things we tend to overlook because of our fullness. And by the way, that's another reason we take communion. To remember what Jesus has done for us, right? As Christians, God has done amazing, amazing work in our lives. We are full, as it were, right? And yet we have to look back and remember where we came from. As you've heard me say so often, we were dirty, stinky, slimy, smelly, scaly fish 
swimming in the cesspool of this world when Christ saved us and cleaned us up. But now that you're clean, never forget where you came from. Amen? Yeah. Now in the positive on, in this proverb, when all your needs are supplied by God and you are a satisfied soul, you have no need to look elsewhere. When the prodigal son returned to the father and was eating the fatted calf, I'll bet he didn't look back on the corn husks he was eating in the pig trough. Amen? Amen. So a satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb, but to a hungry soul every bitter thing is sweet. Now look at verse 8. Like a bird that wanders from its nest is a man who wanders from his place. Charles Spurgeon also used this proverb to talk about those who wander from church to church. He had a name for them. He called them gypsy Christians who have no settled abode and no local habitation. I believe God has a place for each of us. In the church sense of that, that place might be Calvary Chapel Quincy. Or it may be another church in our community or your community if you're listening to this over our video. But at whatever church it is, find it, make it your home, stick it out, stay there, and stop wandering from place to place. Don't be a gypsy Christian. Don't be like a bird that wanders from its nest. Instead, find the place God has for you and make that place your nest where all your needs will be satisfied. Amen? Amen. Now look at verse 9. Ointment and perfume delight the heart, and the sweetness of a man's friend gives delight by hearty counsel. A good friend is like the sweet aroma of ointment and perfume. And this is especially true if your friend is wise and can give you good, hearty counsel. That is, meaty counsel. A counsel that has some substance to it, you see. It's not just light, airy, and shallow, but it's deep. It's satisfying. It's hearty counsel. When I think of this proverb, it, it reminds me that I'm not a soup guy especially those soups that are really watery. You know what I'm saying? Watery soup. I'm not a watery soup guy. I like my soup to be hearty. I like it to be meaty. I like it to be more like a stew. If you have a friend like that, a stew guy, <laughs> who smells good too, he or she will bring delight to your heart because they will speak words of substance to you. Now look at verse 10. Do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend, nor go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. Better is a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. Now this is an interesting proverb because it's given to a people who highly valued family. Yet this proverb tells us that family isn't always the best resource in the day of calamity. In fact, better than a family member who lives far away is a neighbor nearby. Look around and see who God has placed in your circle of friends, neighbors, and acquaintances who may better meet your need in your time of trouble. My brother lives, I don't know, what is it, 2,000, 2,500 miles from me. Certainly better for me, right, is somebody nearby than to get on a plane and fly thousands of miles to a brother afar off. This proverb also reminds us of the importance of our historical relationships. Do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend. There are those to whom God 
or those whom God has placed in our lives, who have been there for us, and even there for our fathers. Don't forsake them as a resource for you in the time of trouble. King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, rejected his father's counselors and instead took the counsel of the young men who were his peers. As a result, the kingdom was divided and split. Judah and I believe Benjamin stayed with Rehoboam and the other ten tribes went north and I think Jeroboam became their king. All because he rejected his father's counselors, his father's friends. Don't do that. The results can be destructive. You know, one of the things, especially in church, for those who have been Christians for a long time, who have grown up in the Lord, they've got a lot of wisdom. They've got a lot to offer you, you see. Take advantage of that. Don't reject the old for or in favor of the new just because it's new. New isn't always better. Amen? How many of you remember the days when they used to make washing machines with cast iron motors and stainless steel tubs? You almost can't get one of those today. It's all plastic. New isn't always better. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, look at verse 11. My son, be wise and make my heart glad that I may answer him who reproaches me. When our children are wise, it, it makes us happy and it gives us an opportunity to boast about our kids to those people who said our kids would never amount to anything. It says that I may answer him who reproaches me. When that fellow says, oh, you know, how's that kid of yours doing that was always in trouble? Oh, oh let me tell you about my kid. You know, a wise son makes the heart glad. And, and, and as we've already read in Proverbs, by the way, wise children are not born wise. How many of you know that? The Bible says that foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. And the rod of correction will drive it far from him. We need to um, raise and train and correct our children to end up with wise children. It just doesn't happen on its own. Now look at verse 12. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. The simple pass on and are punished. And, and we saw this proverb before, back in chapter 22. And, and whenever something is repeated in Scripture, that's because it's important. God wants us to know this. This proverb tells us, quite simply, to be prepared. God is not opposed to our planning and preparation as long as we submit everything to Him. But if we don't plan appropriately, amen, if we don't plan our lives appropriately, if we don't pay off our debt, if we don't save money, in this day and age, after the pandemic, if you don't save a roll, you know, a big case of that Costco toilet paper, <laughs> right? you may find that you're being punished in that day when the calamity comes again. So God's not against preparation and planning. And this proverb tells us to be prepared. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. This proverb also warns us not to put ourselves intentionally in harm's way. And this doesn't apply necessarily to us here, but if, if you live in a big city... And there are areas that are particularly dangerous and you know it. Don't go there. I often read of these, these news articles. So-and-so, you know, this 
got stabbed or shot or killed at 2 o'clock in the morning in the heart of some big city, right? What are you doing out at 2 in the morning? Okay? A prudent man hides himself. You know, he foresees the evil. He knows that's a bad place to be, so he doesn't go there, you see. If you live in an area where cars are often stolen, then park your car in the garage if you've got one, right? I mean, just take practical steps. If you're someplace and you're getting out of your car, before you get out of your car, check your mirrors. Look around. Know your surroundings, right? A prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself. Don't just jump right out. Be aware of your surroundings, especially if you're a, a woman and you're alone and by yourself and you're in a, a, a bigger city. Amen? Amen. A woman? <laughs> All right, look at verse 13. Take the garment of him who is surety for a stranger and hold it in pledge when he is surety for a seductress. <laughs> this proverb simply tells us that we had better get a deposit from someone who is foolish enough to guarantee the loan of a stranger or who has gone into debt because of sinful behavior with a seductress. You better, you better get a deposit from that fellow if you're going to loan him or her any money. Verse 14 says, He who blesses his friend with a loud voice, rising early in the morning, it will be counted a curse to him. <laughs> about 45 years ago, I, I lived in a house ministry with about a dozen other brothers. Uh, Wes Bentley, who many of you know because he's been out here from Far Reaching Ministries, uh, he also lived there and ran that ministry at that time. And this was one of our favorite proverbs to use against those brothers that like to get up early and make a lot of noise. It's not really a blessing to get up early and wake the rest of your family or friends or brothers if they're not ready to get up yet. It's more like a curse than a blessing. In fact, we probably cursed a few of them brothers. <laughs> Look at verses 15 and 16 now. A continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Whoever restrains her restrains the wind and grasps oil with his right hand. <laughs> in the last chapter, we saw that there is a contentious man mentioned in Scripture. He is a man who likes to argue all the time. Well, there's also a contentious woman, and we've seen this before in the Proverbs. She likes to argue. She likes to fight. There's always a fight going on for her. There's always a battle. Everything's an issue. She's like a house with a leaky roof. It's very annoying. And if left unfixed, destructive. But trying to fix this kind of problem is like trying to stop the wind from blowing or trying to grab a hold of oil with your hand. It's nearly impossible. This has got to be a work of God to change that kind of person. So whether they be a man or a woman, a contentious man or a contentious woman who likes to fight, pray for them. God can change any of us, amen? God can change our hearts. God can change our behavior, right? God can change us. Pray for them. There was probably somebody praying for you that you would be saved. And God reached down and saved you. Pray for those kind of people. Now look at verse 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Good relationships ought to have a positive effect on one another. We are to improve one another, to sharpen one another. This is why it's important for brothers to get together for things like men's prayer and men's breakfast or just 
on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night as we fellowship with one another. And the same holds true for the ladies and ladies' events. Don't neglect those opportunities to have a positive effect on one another. And by the way, when iron sharpens iron, when you rub iron against iron, what do you get? Friction. And if you get friction, heat. And if you get heat, fire. But in order to prevent that, what do you put on iron when you're sharpening it? Oil. Oil. That's the Holy Spirit. So when you have the Holy Spirit in your life and in your relationships, as you rub against one another, it should reduce that friction and prevent, prevent fire. Prevent the whole church from burning down. Amen? Amen. Now look at verse 18. Whoever keeps the fig tree will eat its fruit. So he who waits on his master will be honored. The Bible clearly teaches, and we're going to see this later in the Proverbs at the end here of, of verse chapter 27, but the Bible clearly teaches that there should be a reward for work. If you work, you ought to be rewarded. In addition, the Bible clearly teaches the concept of personal and private property. The Bible does not teach socialism and it does not teach communism. If you work hard, you ought to reap the rewards of that hard work. Whoever keeps the fig tree will eat eats fruit. Amen? See? See how that works? And likewise, he who waits on his master will be honored. And conversely, on the other side of that coin, if you will not work, you ought not to eat. And unfortunately, in our current society, and I know you've heard me say this several times through the Proverbs, but in our current society, we tend to punish the workers and reward the slackers. And that's a result of a society that has said no to God and yes to sin. And so they're not getting these things right. It won't be long before there are not enough workers to keep this thing going. And when that happens, society will crash and fall. The answer is Jesus. Amen? Amen. The answer is revival. Only then when men's and women's hearts are changed and transformed Will there be good society, good policy, good legislation, and all that goes with it? Now look at verse 19. As in water, face reflects face, so a man's heart reveals the man. The things that are deep in a man's heart are a reflection of who he really is. The surface is just that. The surface the outer shell. But that's not who we really are. We're not the clothes we wear. We are not the car we drive. We're not the hairdo, the makeup, the nails for the ladies, hopefully. But who we really are is who we are on the inside. That's what counts. That's who we really are. Our heart deep within us reveals who we are. The outside is just that. It's the paint on the outside of a barn. But the hay, that's what's in the barn. Mm -hmm. The cows are in the barn. The milk is in the barn. Amen? Mm -hmm. The good stuff is inside. Now look at verse 20. Hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. Boy, nothing could be truer than this proverb. Certainly, the advertisers know this. They pander to our eyes. As they say in advertising, they say sex sells. And it's hard to find an ad for any product that doesn't include some enticement to the eyes. 
But if that's not enough, the eyes are also enticed by a shiny new machine. For some, it's a shiny new car. For others, a shiny new motorcycle. For some, an ATV, a, a side-by-side, a four-wheeler, a tractor. Uh, for some, a new computer or the latest phone with all the gadgets, bells, and whistles that go with it. Today, in our materialistic society, the eyes of man are never satisfied. So be satisfied with what God has provided for you. Amen? Amen. Be satisfied with what God has provided for you. I had a phone at one time. Literally, it was falling apart. I mean, literally, it was a flip phone. This was in the day when everyone had the newer phones, right? And my phone was a flip phone, and it was like, what is that? Uh, what's the new network? 5G or something? Mine was like 1G, right? <laughs> I mean, it was like 700K. There was no G to it. It was falling. I took it in to have it replaced finally, and, and they laughed at me. But you know what? It worked. I make phone calls. I don't do a lot of other stuff. I pick my phone up, and I make a phone call. And if you call me, I probably don't answer it because it's not in my pocket, right? It's a phone. It's not my lifeline to the world. So I'm satisfied with that. Be satisfied with what God has given you. I probably need to get new equipment. But anyway, that's probably a bad example of that proverb, right? Look at verse 21 now. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. And a man is valued by what others say of him. It's not what a man or woman says of themselves that makes them valuable, but what others say of them. Just like silver and gold are refined in the furnace, and, and that furnace reveals their true value, so too the true value of any person is not what they think or say about themselves. It's what others have to say about them. That's, that's the true value of any of us. Now look at verse 22. Though you grind a fool in a mortar with a pestle along with crushed grain, yet his foolishness will not depart from him. This is a bit of a humorous proverb. It pictures putting a fool, most of you know what a mortar is. It's like a little stone bowl and there's a little stone crushing implement. Some of you crush pills or, or different things in a mortar. That's what a mortar and pestle is. If you put a fool in there with a bunch of grain to, to grind it down to powder, you could do that and still his foolishness will not depart from him. As I mentioned earlier, uh, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child and the rod of correction will drive it far from him. If you don't want to raise fools for children, then direct and correct them early on in their life. It's not mamas don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys, but mamas don't let your babies grow up to be fools, you see? But that doesn't rhyme real well or go with a country song. But correct them and direct them early. Now, Let's look at verses 23 through 27. This all has to do with the same topic. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds, for riches are not forever, nor does a crown endure to all generations. When the hay is removed and the tender grass shows itself and the herbs of the mountains are gathered in, the lambs will provide your clothing, and the goats the price of a field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food, for the food of your household, and the nourishment of your maidservants. So this is another proverb that speaks about the value of hard work, 
the value of diligence in our work. Be diligent to know the state of your flocks. This was a, an agrarian society that raised animals for food and, and for uh, wool and, and all of that, and for milk. They grew, grew crops and grain. It was an agrarian society, so this was important to them, but we can certainly apply it to our own lives and our own work, whatever our vocation, whatever our work is. Be diligent in your work. Be attentive to your work. Know what's going on in your business or, or, or sphere of work or influence. And if you do, if you stay on top of those things and you work hard, you ought to be rewarded for that. You ought to expect to be rewarded. It says the lambs will provide your clothing. The goats, the price of a field. You shall have enough goat's milk for your food, the food of your household, the nourishment of your maidservants. In other words, all your needs are going to be met if you work hard. Conversely, don't work hard. and You don't expect to have your needs met by somebody else. Don't expect me to pay for your needs if you're not willing to work, you see. I hate to say it that way, but that's the truth. Maybe it's because I grew up in a generation that valued hard work. And I think many of you did as well. And I hope the younger generation is, is, is still, you know, still gathering into that. Some great proverbs tonight, huh? <laughs> Some interesting proverbs. You know, it's not hard to get wisdom that can be used and applied to any situation in our life. It's simply found in the pages of our Bible. We need to open it, read it, and apply it. Amen? Let's pray. We'll have the worship team come back up for one final song. Heavenly Father, once again, we thank and praise you for your word, for the wisdom that you impart to us and, and give to us through your word. Things that, Lord, are, are hearty and meaty that we can apply to our everyday life. And so, Lord, I pray that you take these things that we went over tonight out of Proverbs chapter 27. Take those things individually, Lord. You know what each and every one of us needs. What will be meaningful and applicable to our own lives right where we are. Take those things, Lord. Speak them to our hearts. Correct us, direct us, encourage us in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. amen. I don't know about you, but a couple of lessons I learned was eat your stew, get those old school washing machines, and be, be wary of buying shiny new chickens. <laughs> Beat your children. <laughs> yeah. But thank the Lord that we have a Redeemer that has transformed us, right? In all seriousness. Amen. So let's sing and praise our Redeemer.
Father God, thank you for the Redeemer that you've given us. Thank you for giving us your only son to pay for our sins. And thank you for the transformation that it is, is uh, made in our lives and is still making in our lives as we forsake the wisdom of this world, which is foolishness, and embrace the true wisdom that comes from your word. Lord, may we walk in the right way today, tomorrow, and, and every day. Lord, may you guide us by your spirit. May you give us good counsel, even counsel from each other as we uh, encourage one another and sharpen one another. Um, may we be faithful to do that, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for this evening, Lord. We pray, as was prayed earlier, may we all have safe trips home wherever we may be headed uh, in this weather, Lord. And bring us back on Sunday to worship you again. Pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. 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 Thank you.